appreciate the opportunity of this informal hour or less that we have the privilege of spending together. Some year or two back, several years now, I was in uh, China, the rose garden of the world, so they tell me, at a, an institute, and I was sharing the ministry amongst others with uh, a man called Fred Smith, whom probably some of you have come across. He's a, a businessman, heads up a, a big business analysis firm. They move into some of these great empires, and uh, their commission is to evaluate their efficiency and discover whether things could be improved or why things have gone wrong. A very fascinating speaker, one whom I enjoyed immensely. And in particular, I was fascinated by what he had to say on that particular occasion in this particular context. Because he, he explained to us the nature of his business, and how almost from coast to coast they've had the opportunity of evaluating in various business enterprise. And this is what he said. He said, when there is inefficiency, it's almost always one or two courts. Either one, ignorance, or two, conceit. One or the other of those two reasons. Ignorance or conceit. He said, in the first case, if it's ignorance, we can do something about it. We can teach. When he said the cause is the second, can be we write it off as a dead lie. There's nothing we can do. And that's interesting, because by and large, this is equally true in the spiritual life. And there's an immense amount of inefficiency as well you and I are aware within the context of evangelical Christendom and if we're honest enough to recognize the fact in our own hearts and in our own lives. And by and large the inefficiency derives also from one or other or a combination of both these courts. Ignorance which is a very, very large factor because of the pathetically inadequate presentation of the gospel for which we have settled in our pragmatic age and very often conceived. Preconceived notions, prejudices, rigidified forms and patterns from which we're not prepared to diversify. And it's good for us sometimes to pause in the middle of whatever we may be doing and take time to evaluate. But for evaluation to be valid, there's got to be a norm against which we can evaluate. And this, by and large, of course, is the tragedy of our age, that we've settled for dialogue. In other words, there is now nothing absolute. There's no norm. This is the society in which you and I live, and it's on this premise, of course, we have developed the convenience of the participant society, where there is nothing absolute, and therefore nothing is wrong. It's quite obvious. If there's no such thing as truth, then there's no such thing as a lie. I've got nothing to worry about. If there's no such thing as honesty, there's no such thing as being a thief. I've got nothing to worry about. If there's no such thing as morality, there's no such thing as immorality. It's a marvelously convenient hypothesis. And we settled for it because, by and large, all the moral guts and moral fiber has been disintegrating in human society. And nobody ever really wants now to be right or wrong because it demands a moral choice. So we run away from it and settle for something which is pseudo intellectual but is really a moral escapism. And we hide in our little funk hole. Well, where should we find a norm? Where shall we find a yardstick whereby we may make a valid evaluation? Well, of course, there is only one ultimate 
the timeless and eternal absence of God himself. If we depart from that, we've lost everything. And uh, for this reason, I thought it might be interesting, just for the first few moments at least, by way of an introduction, to turn to the second chapter of the last book in the Bible, the Revelation, and meet there the Lord Jesus in company with the church in Ephesus. <laughs> For here the Lord Jesus himself is making an evaluation, and he is the only one who has the right. For he is the timeless absolute, the one who is the same yesterday, today and forever, who never changed. As timeless and unchangeable as God himself. For he is God, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turn. The revelation, as well you recognize, is not the revelation of St. John the Divine, as the title would tell us for some strange reason. <coughs> the first sentence of the first verse of the first chapter tells us that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. To St. John the Divine, of course, was given the privilege of recording for our instruction that revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So John was sent to the scribe to whom this revelation was signified by an angel, a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, or lampstands. The seven stars explained in the 20th verse of the first chapter, are the angels or the ministers representing the proclaimers, those who bear testimony of the seven churches. The seven golden lampstands, here it describes the candlesticks, which are source of the seven churches. Just a picture of the, of the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, that human vehicle through whom he makes himself articulate and visible in the world in which he's placed. The sevenfold golden lampstand. Beautiful picture, of course, both in the Old and the New Testament of the witnessing church, because we recognize that the golden lampstand itself has nothing to give. Absolutely nothing. It's only the oil flowing through it that provides that which sustains the light, which is, of course, immediately an elementary picture of the basic principle of the Christian life that it takes God to be a man. And that's why it takes Christ to be a Christian, because Christ in the Christian puts God back into the man. Detach the man from God and you've got nothing. That's why when the Lord Jesus, out of deity, stepped into time to become man, he made himself exactly what a man is without God. How much is that? Nothing. Philippians 2, 5. That this mind being you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to claim total and eternal timeless equality with God, made himself of no reputation. Emptied himself, made himself new English Bible, nothing. All that a man is without God. <coughs> and then for 33 years, of course, demonstrated that often. So the church is always described as the, as the lamp stand through which the oil must flow, representing the life of God in the soul of man, which is indispensable to the likeness of God in the character of man. What gives him the divine dynamic to fulfill the functions which God as creator created him as his creature. And the Lord Jesus, of course, now is the one who, by his indwelling Holy Spirit, walks, as it were, in the midst of the sevenfold golden lamp. And then, in the second verse, he says something which is immediately frightening. Just two words. I know. I know. And that shatters all the premise of a philosophy that's based upon mere dialogue. <coughs> somebody who actually dares to stand up and say, I know. Well, that's shocking, isn't it? I and mean, that's just not allowed. 
This is proclamation. But this is God. Because God is absent. That's why you and I are called upon as his emissaries, as his voice, to make proclamation, said the Lord Jesus. I know. I don't surmise. I don't pretend. I don't think. I don't hope. I don't just believe. I know. That's right. Because you and I at this very moment share the life of the Lord Jesus. If we don't, we're not Christians. If that isn't true, we've never experienced that spiritual new birth that has made us, again, by the exceeding great and precious promise of God, partake of the divine by me. We're still as bankrupt as the day we were born, dead in trespasses and sin. But as those who claim redemption through his blood, reconciliation to God, and that spiritual new birth, by the restoration of his Holy Spirit to our human spirit, we are at this moment in the presence of and share it all. The life of Jesus Christ. We are in the presence right now of the one who has the right to say and to know that it is true. I know. There's nothing that I don't. Well, what does he know? Well, he he has a good look at this church the church in Ephesus. And he tells us some of the things he knows about this church. He says, I know thy work. I know thy labor. And I know thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them lie. I know. I know that thou hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hath labored and hath not faith. <coughs> I know. Well, let's pause there for a moment and consider the things that he knows about this particular church community, the church in Ephesus. First thing he says is this, I know your work and your labor. I know that you are an extremely busy institution. You're constantly on the job. I know it. I've watched you. I've sat in on all these committee meetings. I'm always there. Okay. Sometimes you behave as I was, but I'm still there. I listen to your aside. I read your thoughts. I know the motivations and intentions of everything that you suggest. The side currents and the cross currents. I know. Read it like a book. I look through it like a pane of glass. I know. The first thing that the Lord Jesus tells us that he knew about this church was that it was a church that sustained an extremely heavy program. Everybody was busy, busy, busy. And of course, there's nothing intrinsically wrong in that. It was incumbent upon every member of this particular church community to be on the job. He's on earth. Nobody was expected to be unemployed. Everybody with any capacity whatever was expected to find their niche and be an action. That's the first thing we know about this church. They probably sustained a wide missionary interest, an evangelistic thrust, constant variety and ingenuity in their means of outreach, In every conceivable way, they were on the job to make the gospel known, to be busy and active in the service of God and his son, Jesus Christ, their Savior. He said, you're busy. I know. That's the first thing we know about this church. Now, the second thing he says he knew about them was this. He says, I know you can't bear them which are evil. In other words, not only was it a church which sustained a very heavy program, it was a church of strong conviction about right and wrong. They drew a very 
คือสิบล้านแต่เฮดไฮดันแอนทรองดิคันดิคแอสต์ตัวสแตนดิ้งที่วิชเดย์ชูสมิทเธอไม่ใช่ไหมไม่มีอะไรที่แอมบิวส์ไม่มีอะไรเกรย์ในการที่จะเข้าใจถ้าคำถามของเสียงถูกเปลี่ยนในเรื่องของสิทธิมนุษยชนคุณร้องเสียงดังๆคุณตัดสินใจของคุณฉันรู้ว่าคุณไม่สามารถเบียดเขาได้ด้วยความรุนแรง So, added to the fact that it was a church that sustained a very heavy program, we r e c o g n i z e the fact that this church in Ephesus was one that held strong convictions about right and wrong. There was no compromise tolerance in this area. Now, the third thing that the Lord Jesus said to you about this church in the second verse was this. That has tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. In other words, a church that has sustained a very heavy program, one that had strong convictions about right and wrong, and one that was utterly sound in its doctrine. It was biblically based. It was a Bible church, if ever there was a Bible church. He said, "You tried them with say they are apostles. You listened to their propositions as those who claim to be the theological and hierarchical big rigs of their day and generation. And in the light of the revelation given by divine inspiration, as holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, you exposed them for the cheats and the liars and the counterfeits that they are. But finally, p u r e Is that it? I listen to all the sermons preached from your pulpit. I listen to all the lessons taught in your Sunday school and Bible classes. I'm always there. I participate in the discussions that you have in your home. Heavy program, strong conviction about right and wrong, and d o c t r i n e Finally, sir. That sounds pretty good, sir. He's making the valuation. Supposing you were a stranger in town, you had a wife and family, and you're looking around for a church home. How about the church in Ephesus? You say, I want the kind of church where I can. Roll up my sleeves and get busy. I don't want to sit in the, you know, on, on the sidelines and just watch. I don't want to be a spectator. I've been to churches like that. The one-man band type. <laughs> I want the sort of church where there's real cooperative effort. Everybody's expected to play their part and be harnessed, as it were, to the machine. What well, effort? I want a church where I can send my kids away for a weekend up the mountain. Entrust them to a, a youth club leader or a counselor, and feel absolutely certain that they won't take place unknown to me anything that would be ambiguous, g r a y that smacks of compromise. I want to feel that they're safe. Okay, yes. I want the sort of church where, whether it's I who sit under the ministry or my wife or my children, no matter who it is that gets up to speak. They will be exposed, always, without exception, to the pure, unadulterated word of God. <laughs> You've really got the church you want. At least, s e r t a i n The amazing thing is that it was a church that, by the Lord Jesus Christ's own evaluation, was on the very threshold. Of its feet, just about to be written off as a total loss.
Nevertheless, he said, verse 4, I have somewhat against you. Something gone wrong. So wrong that it's almost without remedy. Thou hast left thy first love. In all your busy activity, you have departed from the one fundamental basic principle that makes any church to God's satisfaction a working proposition. I like the rendering there of that verse in the Amplified New Testament. It says you have forsaken program. Yes, you've got the program. You lost me. Rules and regulations, convictions, rights and wrongs, yes, it was all tabulated, listed, analyzed, double checked, and underlined. It's taken me. Doctrine? It oozes out of your fingertips, it drips out of your ears. You've mastered the law. You've memorized whole chunks of the Bible, and you preach it with no little skill. You've got everything except. Is this possible? Uh -huh. Easiest thing in the world within the evangelical context of Bible believing believers to substitute the best and all that is legitimate and right and sacred for practice. And you've lost it. That's why, of course, the only valid basis of evaluation is not to the program, not even to your basis of morality, or to the doctrines that you've marked. There's only one valid basis of evaluation, and that is your relationship to Jesus Christ. Because you can have all the rest and not have him. And all too often, you see, we have learned to equate a person's relationship to the machine, to the program. <laughs> We've learned to equate that with a relationship to Christ. We've learned to equate a person's relationship to the rights and the wrongs, to the list of do's and don'ts, with a relationship to Christ. So as long as I submit myself to the machine, so long as I am part of the program, that is accepted as my relationship to Christ. There's nothing to do, nothing maybe farther from the truth. In integrating a person into the operation, I may have introduced only a relationship between them and the program. There's no relationship to Christ. In house training and certain procedures and behavior patterns, I may have introduced only a relationship between them and me and the constituency I represent and the standards that we propound without any relationship to Christ. We equate con we, we, we are a quick consent to certain evangelical doctrines with a relationship to Christ. But that isn't that. I can mark all the doctrines of the Bible and have no relationship to Jesus Christ, but be intellectually convinced of their validity. And in the very proclamation of those doctrines, it is as though Jesus Christ might just well be dead for the part he plays in the process of being a Christian. I had a letter some little time ago from a medical doctor who had been attending some meetings that it had been my privilege to speak at in Phoenix, Arizona, and he had moved out to California. And uh, he just wrote a very courteous letter and just expressed appreciation. He said, in 20 years as a Christian, for the first time I learned that Jesus Christ actually had a role to play in the Christian life. <laughs> now, that used to shock me, doesn't that? Because it refers with such constant regularity. He'd never in 20 years doubted, of course, the fact that his salvation depended upon the death of Christ, that he would only gain access into the presence of the Holy God on the basis of the blood that was shed for him vicariously by the Lord Jesus when he accepted in his person and the consequence of his guilt that he might be acquitted. That he accepted. Jesus Christ, historical, 2,000 years ago, accomplished what would get me out of hell and into heaven. Of course. <clears throat> 
whether once challenged the validity of his resurrection from the dead, or that he has ascended to be with the Father, or shared again now the glory that had always been his in the eternal ages of the past, and will continue to be his in the eternal ages of the future. The only thing he, he, he failed to grasp was that Jesus Christ was not only alive there, but was alive here. And that his presence as God, created within the creature, was imperative to a man's humanity. That Jesus Christ actually had a role to play in the Christian life. You see, so often the Lord Jesus Christ is presented not as the one who plays the role, but the object of our activity. The one for whom we do things. Who's way out there. The man upstairs. All this is calculated to brainwash people into a completely false concept of the Christian life. Jesus Christ isn't the man upstairs. He isn't the way out there. If I'm a Christian at all, it's only because he, having died for me, rose again from the dead to come and give himself to me so that 24 hours and every day my flesh and blood might prove his divine activity exclusively. That Jesus Christ is the only one capable of living the Christian life. And without him there is no Christian life. Only a cheap, shabby imitation of the real thing. No matter how sincere and it is. No matter how noble my aspirations may be. If I haven't yet learned that Jesus Christ actually has a role to play in the Christian life, other than being the object of my endeavor, the hero whom I worship, the one for whom I dedicate myself, and to whom I give my time, that leaves him passive and inactive. He might just as well be a Buddha in his pagoda. <coughs> but we've reduced Jesus Christ precisely to that role, as did the church in Ephesus. He says, you've got everything. Program? Boy, he says, talk about a program. You can see your charts and your missionary graphs. <laughs> and your pledge program. Everything, you've got the last. Everything except me. I have somewhat against because thou hast left thy first love. Notice what he says. It's an ultimatum. First five. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. From whence thou art fallen. He's talking to a fallen church. Repent, he says. Get back to where you belong. First principle. Do the first work. Or else, ultimatum. I will come unto thee quickly, suddenly, calamitously, and remove thy candlestick out of its place. You've become intoxicated with your own endeavor, bewitched by your own smartness, overwhelmed by your own success. And I'll remove the canvas. Write you off as a total loss. Dead wood. Repent or else. Well, uh, the question might reasonably come to mind how can you detect? On the face of it, the casual passerby going into this situation would be. Well, overwhelmed, their breath was taken away. My, what a chance. How can we detect what's wrong? But rather fascinating in this particular situation because we can compare a simple evaluation that was made of another church and we find something that's quite helpful. And keeping the place there in Revelation 2, if you care to turn to Paul's epistles, the first of his epistles to the Thessalonians. And keep the two places open because we'll need to compare what he has to say. Then, of this particular church, with what the Lord Jesus had to say here in the Church of Ephesus. It's quite obvious that this church 
uh, which for uh, Paul here <coughs> in the first of his epistles to the Thessalonians was one that brought him unusual joy and satisfaction in his ministry. He says in the end of verse uh, of chapter 2 and verse 19, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You are our glory. He says, you are our joy. His, his heart warmed quite obviously when he thought of these people. They weren't perfect. He wouldn't for one moment have suggested that. But there was, there was a character about this particular company as of redeemed sinners that, that warmed the heart of the Apostle Paul as others caused him considerable sadness and heaviness as for instance the church in Corinth or the foolish Galatians but this church would be a source of great encouragement he says our gospel verse 5 of chapter 1 came not unto you in word only but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you were ensampled to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God, your relationship to him, the attitude that you adopt, in all that you do and say and are towards God himself is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. We give thanks, he says, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention even in our prayers. And then he goes on in the third verse, and this is a significant verse. Listen. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Where? in our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything's related to him. In the sight of men, purely on the surface, to impress the crowd, uh -huh. in the sight of God and our Father. Do you notice anything? Remembering, he says, your work of faith. What did the Lord Jesus say to the church in Ephesus? Verse 2, chapter 2, I know your work. Where's the faith? He says in the third verse of this one Thessalonians chapter one, your labor of love, said the Lord Jesus to Ephesus, I know your labor. Where's the love? Your patience of hope. Thou hast borne, hast patience said the Lord Jesus to the church in Ephesus. No hope. Work without faith. Labor without love. Patience without hope. That's the evangelical machine. These three, said the Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 13, Faith, hope, love. Grace to thee, love. For faith is to work by love. And the inevitable consequence of a faith that works by love is an unshackable expectation, which of course is the sense in which the word hope is used in the Bible. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped. In other occasion, the Bible says you're saved by hope. Doesn't mean you hope you're saved. <laughs> this is the strong, active, virile, full-blooded sense of the term. Hope as an unshackable expectation that God is big enough. So all you've got to do is let him loose. How do you let him loose? He says. Why? Because you love him. This is the invincible trio. that allows God to demonstrate his deeds. But the church in Ephesus was characterized by work that needed no faith to explain. 
the only quality of life in you and me as Christians is that quality of life that books with absolutely no explanation for Jesus Christ himself. The moment you want to live your Christian life on the basis of your personality, you will achieve exactly what personality will achieve. And you won't need Jesus Christ. Your Christian life will be explicable in terms of you. Therefore, there will be only one person to be congratulated. That's the object of the exercise. You want to live a Christian life on the, on the basis of your determination, your willpower, okay? Take a course in permanence. And personality projection. And what you achieve will be based upon your willpower and your determination. You won't need Jesus Christ. There will only be one person to be congratulated. It won't be him. Enthusiasm. Sentiment. Thousand and one good things, legitimate things, can be your motivation. But the moment they take the place of Jesus Christ, they become the object of your idolatry. And Jesus Christ becomes superfluous to the exercise. They had a program of work that needed no faith to explain. Everything was underwritten, fully guaranteed, and no risks were taken. There was no margin of difference. There were one or two of you, I believe, there on Saturday when I gave this simple proposition that everything that God demands of a man is completely logical. But so far as man is concerned, totally unreasonable. For instance, God says, I am holy. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. This is God in all his utter holiness telling a man to be as holy as God. From God's point of view, utterly logical. From man's point of view, hopelessly unreasonable. How can I as a man be holy like God? Well, the answer, if you remember in that proposition, was this. Because there is in the divine logic a hidden factor that is absent in human reason that makes divinely possible what is otherwise humanly unreasonable. And that hidden factor is God himself who works in you both to will and to do as his place. Faithful is he that calls you who will also do it. So there is absolutely nothing to which God calls you that he himself is not prepared to do. So that makes divinely logical and possible everything which otherwise is humanly unreasonable. But take the hidden factor out, and what have you got left? A proposition that is humanly unreasonable. That's why you've got to settle for something less. That is humanly explicable. And that's what the Church of Ephesus said that settled for. Work that needed no faith to explain. Faith that isn't believing facts or giving academic consent or a mental nod to certain theological propositions. Faith, as you will remember, simply lets God be God in action. Faith invokes the activity of a second party. Faith brings somebody or something into action on your behalf. And if your faith doesn't do that, if your faith, that you call faith, doesn't bring God into action, it isn't faith. Faith must bring somebody or something into action on your behalf. Otherwise it's just a belief. My belief tells me that the plane will fly at a certain time. My faith sits in it. And lets the plane that I believe would fly at a certain time take me to my destination. That's the difference between the two. And by and large, within the evangelical context, we have substituted belief for faith. And we equate now people believing things and giving mental consent to certain evangelical doctrines with the faith that lets God translate them into the flesh and blood of our humanity for which there's no possible explanation but God himself. Work without faith to explain. Labor that needed no love to compel it. And a patience that needed no hope to sustain it. That was characteristic of the church in Ephesus. 
work that needed no faith to explain it, labor that needed no love to compel it, and a patience that needed no hope to sustain. For this good reason, that there was absolutely no margin of difference between the program and what was reasonably possible on the basis of human ingenuity. And there was absolutely no margin between the service rendered and the adequacy of the reward given. And not just think in terms of dollars and cents. I'm not just thinking in terms of that kind of reward. There are many other rewards which people <coughs> will render first and without which they won't. Quite apart from dollars, glamour, recognition, applause, limelight, success, position, office, power, promotion, excitement, the ultimate trip, going high on Jesus. Those are the rewards that people are looking for by and large today. For labor that in God's estimate can only be compelled by love. Without reward. There was no margin of difference between what was patiently expected and what had already been carefully provided. So nobody planned, did or expected anything which wasn't reasonably possible, adequately rewarded or already provided. That was the church in Ephesus. It was a perfect machine that worked magnificently without Jesus Christ. The program was professional, absolutely top. The motive was materialistic, even though they had become so acclimatized to it they weren't even rec able to recognize the symptoms. And their stamina had become stagnation. It was terror. Destitute of any real reproductive life. And Jesus said, No, I'm not guessing. I'm not guessing. I'm not just suspecting. It isn't just a hunch I've got. And a repent or a and of course in this we easily recognize the true nature of repentance. An attitude that makes God imperative to the exit. Dependent. What happened when man fell into sin is that he believed the devil's lie that a man could be actually a functional man without God, that Jesus Christ doesn't actually have a role to play in the Christian life. Even if you want to be a Christian, this is the carnal mind that is perpetuated within the regenerate. Because what's the difference between Christian, a Christian who believes that he can successfully live the Christian life without Christ, and Adam, who believed the devil's lie that he could be a successful man without God, what's the difference? What's the difference between a Christian trying to live a Christian life without total, step by step, moment by moment, breath by breath, dependence upon Christ as the sole and exclusive origin of the act, and a man believing the devil's lie that a man can be a man without God? Absolutely none, whatever. And there's nothing that tickles the devil more than Christians in the very propagation of their faith who are perpetuating the Adam creed of self-sufficiency and trying to live a Christian life without Christ as Adam tried to be a man without God. Nothing is more subtle than that. But it is the pitfall into which you and I unwittingly and without insincerity can so easily fall. The moment we're prepared to substitute anything or anybody for Jesus Christ himself. When Adam fell into sin, he traded dependence for independence. So repentance takes place only when we trade independence for dependence. So the measure of your repentance and mine is simply the measure in which we are dependent. Any error in your life or mine in which we continue to be independent is an error in which we have not 
repent. No matter where that area may be, whether it's in the pulpit, if I can get into the pulpit and by virtue of custom, practice, repetition, can get by, that's an error which I've never repented. Even though what I say is biblical. That is the great moment of truth for Hudson Taylor. When he realized that for all these years in China, he'd been rushing around with a busy branch trying to bear fruit for the vine. <laughs> suddenly he saw it. You see, for all too long, he had thought, when Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branch, he was distinguished between vine and branch. As though the branch one thing and vine the other. And suddenly he saw it. If he is the vine, vine includes the branch. You don't have a vine without branches. A vine incorporates the branch, embraces the branch. And when Jesus said, I am the vine, that includes the branch. And suddenly the moment of truth dawned upon his poor, battered soul. When Jesus said, I am the branch, he included me as part of him called branch. All I've got to do is abide. Then he who is the vine, including the branch, through me the branch, abiding in him, will bear fruit. All I've got to do is stick my fingers up. And a thousand missionaries went to China. A.B. Simpson. Dwight Moody, Andrew Murray, F.B. Meyer, Jonathan Edwards. These are names of men and women in whose frail humanity God rocked the world. Not because of what they there, but what they discovered Jesus Christ to be. When he's got any old drain pipe open both ends and nothing in the middle that'll let the water flow. I'm so thankful personally for the moment in my own life as a Christian. And at the age of 19, seven years after my conversion, in which I had sincerely accepted Christ as my Redeemer and had been no less sincerely programmed by those who knew no better as to the procedures of the Christian life which were to be equated with my relationship to Christ. But left me at the end of seven years defeated, frustrated, exhausted, and debilitated. Already in my second year training as a doctor to become a medical missionary in Africa, leader of the Indivarsity Christian Fellowship, spending all my vacation, Bible camp, preaching in the open air, witnessing right, left, and center on every committee I could lay my hands on, <laughs> thinking that fervent activity could be equated with a true relationship to Jesus Christ, and with no insincerity, I loved him with all my heart. And it was for this reason that in utter sheer despair, in total exhaustion, finally, with tears in my eyes, I got down on my knees and said, Jesus Christ, I'm quitting. Not because I don't love you, I do, but because, quite obviously, I'm a total, hopeless, utter thing. And you might just as well write me off now as for me to go on playing hmm? the past. I know if I go to Africa as a missionary, I'll be as useless there as I have been in England. And I'm so tired. I can't stand it. I'll be there. I'll sit. I'll watch. From now on, I'm in spectator. But I'm quick. And I almost heard him sigh with relief. <laughs> <laughs> this was the moment of truth. It was almost as though he was standing in the room. He said, Thank you. At last. This is what I've been waiting for for seven years. For seven years, you've been trying to live for me with no insincerity, with the utmost devotion, with all your ability. You've been trying to live for me a life that only I can live for. At last, you've discovered why I died for you. That I might, risen from the dead, come and give myself to you, share my life with you, and let that life loose through. And you know, the whole Bible from that moment became a new book. That was nearly 40 years ago. 39. It precipitated immediately into that ministry in which it's still my joy to participate. Within five weeks, I'd left the university. 
I suddenly thought for seven miserable years I've been asking Jesus Christ to give me what I already had. I didn't receive one thing new, not one thing. For Jesus Christ at the age of 12 had already come to inhabit my humanity but I'd locked him up downstairs in the cell. Like foolish Galatians, having begun my new life through the Holy Spirit, the presence of a risen Lord within my heart, I've tried to be made perfect in the flesh. Tried to be made perfect in the flesh. My, what a relief. What a relief to discover that he had never ever expected of me anything more than the failure that I'd been. That's a relief. But you can stop apologizing to yourself. How often our prayer life is one long apology. We go to confession very well. Oh God, fancy me doing that. And you know what God says? Fancy you doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Wallace used to say, some people go around with a skunk rather and they're always complaining of the smell. Why do you stick it over the head? Where God put it. On the cross, there was executed in the person of Jesus Christ all that you are. Apart from all that Jesus Christ is. Why not leave it there? And step out into the abundant, magnificent, fabulous provision that God has provided for you in the glorious fact that Jesus is alive, not only in heaven but in you, to share the illimitable resources of deity and all you've got to do is let him loose. When I got up next morning, I said, Jesus Christ, I've got nothing but a history of faith and look back on for seven years, but for the first time in my life, I'm going to dare to believe that because you not only died for me, but rose again to live within me, you're going to do something worthy, no longer what I can do for you, but what you can do for me. Thanks for the soul you're going to say. Thanks for the blessing you're going to bring. Thanks for the lives you're going to be transformed. And I can't explain it to you, but the moment I began to say, thank you, Lord Jesus, instead of please, Lord Jesus, people got saved almost every day for five and a half weeks until at last, he tapped me on the shoulder again and said, I've just given you a little taste, a little foretaste of good things to come, but I, I just want to remind you of the fact you can't have your program and my life. You can only have my life and my program. And you're not going to be a doctor. You're not going to do Africa. You're going to leave the university, go up and down the British Isles and tell people I'm alive and not dead. Okay? <laughs> be a doctor if you like. Go to the mission if you like, but without me. <laughs> and you'll come back every three or four years with a little box of flies. <laughs> <laughs> and tell you a weary story. And I said, no thanks. <laughs> I've got a box of <laughs> But it isn't a weary story. And boy, it's just been the most marvelous adventure since then. Recognizing I can't, but he can. Always made aware afresh again and again by the Holy Spirit of our own inherent weakness and bankruptcy. But just to discover how full is the life that is ours in Jesus Christ. And at the age of 19, he precipitated me upon this particular ministry to which God has so graciously called me, though the least of all his saints and the chief of sinners. Just to tell folks that Jesus is alive and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. If only we'll let him loose. And all you've got to do in every situation to which every new step takes is to bow yourself out and bow him in and say, I can't, but you can. I'm available. At the receiving end of your instruction, waiting for you to vindicate your deeds. And every new experience of his power released in terms of our availability undergirds our faith for the next adventure. And the more difficult it is and the more challenging, the more frightening, the more hilarious it becomes. God, it was pretty tough yesterday, but boy, this is a corker. It's going to be exciting to see how you handle it. Thanks so much that you're God. And I'm not. <laughs> and so where does the responsibility rest? Fairly and squarely upon his broad shoulders. And they are big enough. And that's great. Well, we'll have to stop. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, because of who you are. So much more wonderful even than what you did. So we're deeply thankful for that. Because it's only what you did that makes it possible for us now to enjoy what you are. Forgive us we pray you for the folly of enjoying what you did without daily enjoying what you are. We want you to find in our redeemed humanity an outlet for your deity. Those through whom you can demonstrate the fact that you're alive. We want the quality of life, dear Lord, that can be explained only in terms of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this glorious prospect. Thanks to those who are now bowed in your presence and the desire that you've already awakened long since in our hearts to be expendable. Thank you for those who are going to come alive 
as your life through them is released to us to the uttermost ends of the earth it's so wonderfully indescribably exciting we don't deserve it and we don't ask for anything that might be described as sensational or spectacular but we cannot and will not Lord Jesus settle for anything less than the miraculous to which only God himself can be the explanation and for your dear name's sake Amen Thanks so much it's so good to be with you I've got a back off we've got the other meeting now and I'm sure you and Boreas answered and said to her, it has fully been... Just a quick question. How many years did it take you to switch over from the old way to the new way? <laughs> I don't know that you were doing it consistently. The principle I began to practice overnight. And nothing has ever changed that principle. Quite frankly, in the simplest possible terms, I stopped saying, please, and started saying thank you. I entered into what you may call the assumption of faith which I've already entered into so far as my redemption was concerned seven years before. I'd never in those seven years asked Christ to redeem me again. I'd entered into the assumption of faith. All I learned that night was to assume, assume that he was alive in me as once I'd learned to assume that he died for me and say thank you. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that overnight I entered into the fullness of what was mine. Every day since then and still today is a new discovery of the illimitable resource. And I don't mean that there aren't occasions, many of them, all too many, in which I could kick myself for failing to say thank you and going out on a limb on my own pouring flat in the face. But the marvelous thing is when you do that, you know the principle you violate. <laughs> you see? And when you fall flat in your face, you get up and say, Lord, I know exactly what I did. I was stupid enough to assume responsibility for that as though I could when I couldn't. Hmm. But you promise instant cleansing. The moment I admit it, thanks for the cleansing. I'm back where I belong. I don't even know how to clean up the mess that I've made, but you do. <laughs> thanks very much. You then look at the devil straight in the eyes and say, I appreciate the help you just given. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the further demonstration that I can't, but only Christ can give me a real service. I needed that reminder. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> and you can turn your very defeat into victory. <laughs> Never consider yourself to be infallible. You're not. There's only one who's infallible, and that's Jesus Christ. You get back to where you belong when you need the reminder that you're not. <laughs> that's all. And uh, that's a process that has enriched my life all the years and it's still in being, you see? So the principle never changes, that I enjoy the novel, constantly multiplied. And every new experience that is added to it comes a memory. And that memory undergirds, you see, the new situation. So finally, you begin to speak out of the abundance of your heart, an accumulation of memories of those experiences of his adequacy. That's what we call growth and grace. So you see, simply to repeat, to repeat a doctrine, you begin to speak out of your experience. Not your experience of yourself, but your experience of him. And you share Christ. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. The following is uh, where Ian Thomas is at Los Altos Baptist Church speaking in Ruth, the second chapter. Let me said unto her, the man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. As you sought grace in the infinite mercy of God, you have encountered the one who has the right to redeem. The near kinsman who can purchase us out of bankruptcy and give back life to the lifeless. Well, isn't that a great story? Of course, we've only just begun. We're just paddling in the shadow or the shallow. A whole lot more to happen yet. We haven't got anything near to the message of the book. But at least we're doing a little homework and laying the foundation 
of those further discoveries that we're going to make as we continue tomorrow night and discover the lavish provision that God makes for those who seeking grace find the greater Boaz, the mighty man of wealth, in whose presence for time and eternity you can cry, Redeem! For God has not appointed us to walk but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, still physically alive on earth or already dead, absent from the body in heaven, whether now or then, in time or eternity, here or there, we should live together with him. Redeem. One of the loveliest young fellows who came from Germany, 15, 16 years old, arrived in my home, I suppose about 15 years ago now, hold the blue. One of the finest youngsters I've ever met. Upright, frank, noble, open-hearted, brilliant in his work at school without being a bookworm. He was a fine sportsman, a personality that you couldn't help but be enamored with. His parents told me that when he set out on that journey to visit us for that summer vacation, just before he left the home, he turned to his mother and he said, Mother, I'd just like to thank you for all you've done for me. The way you cared for me, clothed me. When I was a little baby, you took such meticulous care. When I was sick, you nursed me. Thank you. Then he turned to his father. He said, Father, I want to thank you too. You worked so hard. You took me to a good school. You've given me a lovely home. And now you've made it possible for me to go on this journey. I want to thank you. There's not a little way to say goodbye. And then they watched him as he strode down the street on a beautiful sunny July morning for his first journey outside of his own country. He arrived on a Wednesday. And in a couple of days, he knocked on my study door and in a very sweet, winsome way, he said, Could you help me? and told me how he felt his need of Christ as his Savior. And I had the joy and privilege. And it was so easy because he was so willing just to introduce him to Christ. That night we had what we call on Fridays a say-so meeting when anybody can stand up and he was the first to his feet to tell the folks how that day he had received Christ into his life. He did it in English, perfect. He'd made friends with a fine young man who was an acting pastor of a Baptist church which was so small they couldn't afford to sustain a pastor so he worked past time and pastored the church free and for nothing. Very fine young man. And he had promised his grandparents that he would visit them while staying with us some 40 miles away in a place called Blackpool. And on the Tuesday morning he was driving out of the courtyard on his motorcycle when he saw Holger and he said, would you like to come and hold him a <laughs> the woman said, yes, jump on the back and off they went. And an hour later, both of them were dead. Hit a truck, they were both catapulted into the air and killed outright. And I had one of the most tragic duties to perform that I can remember. To tell his parents that their only child and their only son was dead. His father was a very honorable, fine, God-fearing, upright man. He flew into Manchester. I met him at the airport. We had a service of remembrance for them both. And when I went out to fetch the father from his room to bring him down to that service, I saw him standing, trembling, with a piece of paper in his hand. When I came to him, he said, I found it in his wallet. It was the testimony that he had given on the Friday evening, first written in German and then translated into English. written on that piece of paper with these words. God gives to every person, at least once in life, the opportunity to find him. Today I took that child. I'd felt so unclean inside that I went to a friend and asked him if he could help me. And he led me to Christ. And now, now I know and this is how he put it. I am a member of his congregation. And underneath one word in big block capitals. 
Redeemed. Redeemed. Yeah, that's it. He sought grace and met the one who has the right to redeem. Our greater Boaz. Mighty, mighty man of work. In time or eternity. In the body or out of it. On earth or in heaven. To live together with him. Redeemed. Could you write across your life tonight? In his dear name who made it possible. For time or eternity on earth or in heaven. I share life with him who is my Lord. Redeemed. Let's bow our heads in prayer. It's all so marvelously simple and so good of God. As her hat was, seeking grace, she found him. If you're a Christian, just say thank you again tonight for God's goodness. That he ever passed your way. With renewed desire, place yourself at his disposal. That he through you might reach others. That you to them might be his voice. His touch. His shadow. If I'm talking to a boy or a girl or a man or a woman tonight, and deep down within your soul there is this God-shaped blank, this homesickness for heaven that has never been satisfied, remember, all you have to do, in the light of all that he has done, 